Welcome to the Maintenance Mavericks podcast, where we talk about trends in maintenance, reliability, and asset operations. I'm Ryan, I'm your host. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep, which is an asset operations management platform. For today's guest, I'm super excited to welcome back our very own Ramesh Gulati. Ramesh is the reliability Sherpa himself and is uh, one of our uh, favorite and recurring guests here on the podcast. Um, it's always a blast having you on the show. Welcome back, Ramesh. How's it going? How are you doing? <laughs> great. I'm doing great. Hey, always looking forward for this day in a month so we can talk and learn from each other and share with our all our clients and customers and I feel like we've been we've been doing this podcast you've been a recurring guest for probably you know almost a year or over a year now Ramesh yeah. and again really appreciate you doing this again you know we just talk about everything maintenance reliability the trends going on right now obviously you've seen a lot in this space from good to bad to ugly to great i think what we're noticing right now and what i kind of want to center today's conversation around is this idea of the digital transformation on factory floors you've worked in a lot of different asset intensive businesses we've been talking about digital transformation for a really long time what does digital transformation mean to you? And, you know, how do you see this within like, you know, asset intensive businesses? Like what's actually going on right now? Great question to start with our today's talk. Well, let me spend a couple of minutes first. What does digital transformation mean? Okay. Digital transformation is a user digital technology enabling us to do better. Okay, that's what it is. So again, a good example would be how we can use digital technology to make our process, whatever do, better, okay? These are two things. One is a digitization and digitalization, two things. Digitization is making your document in a digital form, okay? And then digitalization is a process you how you do that okay and good example would be in just reminds me a few weeks ago i had to change my heart doctor and usually in the past something happened they want hey what has my history so it used to be a big file of my what my doctor has told me to take to this new doctor this time nothing i just signed it and he sent all digital form. And he, my doctor, new doctor, has all the information, what prescription I'm taking and what kind of medication. He had. He could see it right away. Within a few minutes, he got it, everything there. You know, even your bank transfers, you know, one bank to another bank to something, how easy is nowadays? Just on your telephone, you can make those. That's a digital transformation, you know. Now, Think about that in our workplace. Workplace, what we're talking is how we can get that information, all those drawings, all the paperwork. So this really means without paper. So our work orders are created on our PCs or our phone or iPad or something, and we can see it. And if there's some attachment, pictures or something, we can see those right away, okay? We can see what kind of, if we are looking for some parts and we can go see in our telephone and see if that parts is available in our store or not, or where we can get it. So all those kinds of things help us to do our job better. That's really in, in just a short essence of this realization. But it's a challenging task. It's not easy. Some people still in our workforce like me who are still working, <laughs> I mean, again, I'm kind of, a, they're afraid of PCs or computers, all these kind of things. And that requires a lot of training, education. So it's going to take a while. It's not easy. And to take, get to a really digitalization, that transformation, okay? The whole thing. And it's not a just one thing, it's a lot of things we have to change. There's a legacy system, how we can access to those kind of things. So in a nutshell, 
digitalization, to, you know, help us to do our job better, faster, quickly, those kind of, that's in a short form. So I think what I hear from you, there's like two components of this transformation. One is like, you know, taking paper-based stuff, moving it to this digital world. And the second one is taking technology and augmenting people and pro process to help us do our jobs better. Like that, that from my understanding is... Exactly, you're right. Again, we are taking, changing our documentation or digital form. Also, we are adding industry 4.0 kind of thing, IoT and artificial intelligence or those kind of things, how we can make our things better. I was amazed on our TV remote control. I mean, again, they have put AI, artificial intelligence in a remote control. So remote control after a while knows that between nine to 11, if I switch on, I switch to this channel. Bloomberg <laughs> Business Channel. I was the other day, I was looking, I said, last night I was looking this channel, but now when I start, it's a different channel because it learned my habit, oh. you know. So What kind uh, of TV do you have, Ramesh? I need to get that one. <laughs> a remote, it's a remote control, your <laughs> dish remote control. So it kind of learned oh. how I'm doing. You know, so it learned that between this time in the morning, eight o'clock, I watch channel five. Between yeah. eight to 10, I watch this channel, so <laughs> automatically start that channel. I was kind of amazed. Uh, they have put AI in this, uh, you know, remote control. So yeah. that's kind of thing. So these kind of practices we can apply in our process too, you know. So I want to play devil's advocate here a little bit because you know, I've been hearing this term digital transformation for a very long time, at least the last 10 years. We've heard yes. this like digital transformation, digital transformation in the industrial setting. When I look at a lot of industries around me that are very adjacent to upkeep or customers, like I still see a lot of paper. And when you talk about the first step of this digital transformation is move paper into this digital format, I look around and I say, how far are we really on this journey? Not that far. <laughs> because, no, it's a habit. Think we do certain things in a way and we get used to that way of doing it. Changing that habit is a difficult. Again, that's a change management. What happens is we, are, we form a habit of doing certain things, looking, I got a habit when I'm reading more than two, three, four pages, I want to have a paper. I want to, <laughs> you know, I want to see that. So I can, again, because I don't read right away on the computer, I make a copy of his eight or 10 pages and lazily sit down on a chair and then read it and then make a comment. And some people, young guys like you or some others, hey, they can do on a computer, I can't do it. So it's a habit. So yeah. we are used to seeing work order in a, a paper form and changing that habit, it's not going to go in. It's going to take a while. So yeah. that's problem, challenge. How change we change our habits to a new technology? And we have to see who is, maybe there's a happy media in between you know, something, hey, something people had to write something on that. So other people, I mean, this was a many years, not many, eight, 10, 12 years ago, we were put in our new CMMS system and we wanted people to do the feedback. And some of our older guys were scared to go to the computer to do something on that. So literally what we had to do was we had to assign a administrative person with the supervisor, craft supervisor, hey, he will take, he will, people will write on a paper, then this lady will input that on the computer. Yeah. Yeah. Then she started doing handholding. They got on the computer, hey, you do this. Then they started doing it. So it's a lot of training and education, changing people's habit, and that's the toughest part. I mean, it's just so interesting at a very, very high level, like yeah. 
you know, you hear it from GE big companies that talk about digital transformation is like probably one of the most important things to some of the biggest companies out in, their, in the world. Yeah. When you hear like earnings calls, when you look at like, you know, their reports, like everything is around like physical businesses moving more and more towards technology. But I think you and I, who are, and probably all of our listeners today, who are much, much closer to the ground, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, you hear it at their earnings calls, yes. but what's actually happening in practice is so different. It's so different. And I'm just trying to f- find the bridge between this, like almost seemingly like disconnect between what executives are talking about on Wall Street and what is actually going on on the shop floor and the plant floor. Yeah, it's, I mean, people have it. I'll give you another example was, uh, we had a meeting, this was five, four or five years ago in Chicago. Uh, we were talking part of reliability web is uh, IOT related, okay? And the question was raised and they were, we were people from Boeing, even Siemens and few other people, company who do the this, uh, Honda, those people were there. And we were talking, you know, how long is it gonna take to get IoT, these smart sensors, you know, application of those in the field? This is about, I think it's a four or five years ago, and still companies are struggling. And answer by this guy who was, I think was a Boeing guy from South Carolina, said, hey, we are concerned, we have to educate our people, you know, this technology, and we are not sure the reliability of these sensors yet, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, again, we want to make sure those sensors, I mean, we have been using hardwired sensor from long time. Get rid of those, put, you know, wireless sensors, we have to see how good they are, their reliability, all these kind of issues are there. So now I think we are realizing after four or five years are gone, we have tried a lot of places, we are trying these wireless sensors and they're, they are more now solid state sort of a, no moving parts. So they are much more reliable, Yeah. okay? So we have been proven, so it takes a while and then accept again, keeping acceptance of this new technology always takes time. It's yeah. not easy. What we're really talking about is like at the highest level at the executives, we're talking about like what does the end state look like? And it's like the yeah. full digital, digital digitalization of their entire business, you know, top to bottom. And yeah. I think what we're seeing right now is at the ground level, it's like, you know where we are and where we need to go. So it's almost this journey towards this digital transformation. You are exactly right. In fact, when I teach, I teach at three, four different universities and it's it's still amazed to see. And I usually get 20 people or something, 20 to 30 people in the class. And when I talk to them, when I talk about CMMS system, and I ask, how many of you have a CMM? First question on that subject. And usually there is a one or two people. I mean, about 10, 8% or something in the class who say, we don't. You're still using spreadsheet. Then I have to tell, you guys are crazy. I mean, <laughs> nowadays you can get a $5 per asset or $10 per asset per something so cheap while you are using spreadsheet, you know. So I have to tell these online systems available, you can do it, but still they don't, you know. So there are people, I mean, CMMS system, I got acquainted back in 70s, you know, when they just came on a PC, you know. Since I've been 50 years, (laughs) still people don't have it. You know, again, I can see 50 years ago, they were very expensive. But now with yours, your upkeep, so see, cheap, I mean, cheap, I mean, they, with very little money you can get in a business, you know, CMM system, but people are still yeah, scared or afraid or whatever, they are not, don't have it. They're yeah. still using spreadsheets, you know, <laughs> I cannot believe it. It takes time. So the road to this digital transformation takes time. 
the, yeah. the super high level. So like maybe the question we're master is like, what are the steps towards getting to this end state of like, full digital transformation where you're leveraging like di digital twins and AI and machine learning and all this cool stuff. And then ultimately where we are today, which is like hardly moving a lot of our business process over to, um, you know, from paper and pen into this digital world. Like what are the different steps in between? Let me give you another example, similar to this, our CM process. Yeah. Back in sixties, RCM was born out of Boeing's 747. When they were developing 747, when they went to uh, FAA for certification, they said, no, you have to have a three times more maintenance operation kind of thing. And out of that came out, they did an RCM process back in 70s and came out. Boeing did that. How many companies in the world or in US or North America are using RCM to its advantage? Very few. It's a lot of challenges. It has been 50 years. Even Boeing, who developed that technology or was instrumental getting RCM process. Back in 70s, their plans took them 15, 20 years to implement. And they have not implemented fully yet. Yeah. You know, so it takes time. To others, it's a, again education. People are get scared, or it takes too much time. Yeah. Anytime you bring a new technology, you have to prepare people for it. Educate. You have to do the training, awareness, change management process. You know, when we put our CMMS system back in ninety late 80s and 90s, you know, we had something, but put a new one there. We did a good change management process by roles, who's going to do what, why this important, how it's going to help you. We created WIFM, what's in for me, by role, by role, you know, how it's going to help you. Same thing, this is a transformation, we have to do the same thing. It's a change management process. Acceptance is a key thing, and we have to prepare people. Now, one good thing is happening. Our young guys, Z millennium or millennium or Z generation guys, they are already in digital kind of thing. I mean, they, they are playing with iPad babies, iPad babies. You know, they are playing. They came out of this digital age to speak. So they are in it, they know it. So it's much easier for them to accept it. So that's a good thing is happening for us. You know, that the new people coming in operational maintenance field are already in digital savvy. So that's going to help us. But again, it's a change management. What's in for me? Why should I change? I've been used to this paper. Why should I get rid of? I want to see the drawing. Yes, you can see, I can see the drawing on a computer or should I physical art drawing want to see? You know, those are kind of issues, you know. But again, as you said, it takes time. My experience over the years, it takes you a long time, depending upon the how big your organization, it may take you two or three years or maybe 10 years to change a culture. And then also you have to keep reinforcing that concept. Hey, yeah. uh, if you don't do that, you fall back to old habits. So change takes time. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, yeah, we, we have changed a lot, actually. And I feel like I did downplay, like, you know, a lot has actually changed over the last 10 years. We have come a long way. Yeah. Ramesh, you brought up something really, really, really interesting. You, you mentioned that RCM was born out of, you know, the, the Boeing 747. And you're absolutely right. Like a lot of best practices and reliability actually did start in aerospace. You know, ultimately it's kind of like, you have to have extreme reliability when you're flying a plane 500 miles an hour up in the sky, 30,000 30, feet above, uh, above ground because it is truly a life and death situation. 
Yeah. Two things happened this week, and I'm sure you're very well aware of, of what happened. One, Boeing did settle for the 2018-2019 crashes on the MCAS system that caused two of these failures to happen. Um, they settled for $237.5 million. And then the second thing that happened this week, or maybe it was last week, there was another crash on a 737. Well, it was 737, but it was not Max. It, it was, was not China. a Max, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. in China. They don't know their time. Usually, most of crashes happen when you are you know, going up or going to landing or something. Yeah. But this is mid-air, you know, took a really yeah. deep drive, and they don't know, so they're trying to find what could cause that kind of, you know. Right. So I'm sure we're going to find out what happens, but maybe if we rewind back to 2018, 2019, like, are, are these the challenges with the MCAS solution? Is that like, do you believe that is a reliability problem? Was that something that should have been caught? I think it is a quality problem because they're somehow they speed up the process somewhere and didn't look at all the data, I think. Because that's again, I'm not in, in in it, but I may be wrong. But somewhere they missed few things, or you know, they looked all the data to you know what we're telling them and design the things properly or somewhere. I think in there they want to speed up. I think that's somewhere also I read they are trying to compete with the Airbus or something time, so they want to get them out earlier or something. It you know, so somewhere something happened on the quality or reliability issue, which they overlooked it and that caused that problem. You know, it was software, I think somewhere software issues or something. Yeah. yeah. What the, the issue was, was like, there was a, there, it was a software upgrade, you're right, to yeah. manually adjust the tilt yeah. of the plane based off of one of the sensors in the front. But what they they didn't account for was if the sensor was broken, how would the plane react in that situation? Yeah. yeah, I'm watching this like Netflix documentary right now. And it's kind of talking about like, ultimately what the MCAS solution was doing was again, like trying to prevent failures from happening in these worst case scenarios, but they didn't, they adjusted this software system to make life and death decisions here based off of this one sensor. And yep. maybe maybe what I'm trying to highlight here is like, I mean, I believe that it is a reliability, I mean, maybe not problem, but it could have been caught better by reliability because we oftentimes look at our assets in this like critical point of failure, but then we forget like, if this, this one uh, component within our asset relies on another component. And if this component fails, then the main component will fail. Situation is really is, what's my default? You know, if this sensor doesn't work, where should I stop? Yeah. How I can be fail safe condition? You know, the, in fact, there was an issue, I was talking to my friend, up, he just retired from Michelin. And he and I was talking this for a few years back. What he used to do at, you know, when we set up a control system, and that's a, always a challenge. We go between mechanically, electrical, all these people. So he used to get them all in one room, mechanical, electrical, then go to the ladder diagram and set up how, what's a fail safe position for these controls. When your machines are with something going this way, something going that way, something coming, if something happened, the sensor don't work, what could cause the problem? How to stop the some kind of fail safe situation? Yeah. And he used to get them all the players in one room, let them start talking to each other so you can come up a better, you know, a, a scenario where you have a fail safe operation that something if we, power is gone or this sensor doesn't work where machines should stop is in a fail safe position or not so yes it could be a reliability issue which they forgot what's a default if something happens where it's going to stop 
you know. Yeah. And that's what I think this flare point, if a, something happened, if a signal doesn't come, we should stop, you know. Yeah. That's a, should have this, should have thought about that, you know, somehow. I mean, it's such a like interesting question because when I was at Process Engineering, it was like, you know, you ask the question like, why it's like the five whys, right? You, you kind yeah. of like go five le- levels deep, but then you could also ask the question, why don't, why do we stop at five? This is, uh, really came out of this five was from Toyota, the guy who was, he said, hey, keep asking question five times, usually you get the answer, you know? So it's not a five, you know, exactly five. Same thing in the 80, 20 principles. It's not 80% or 20%. It could be 30, 70 or 60, 40 or 15, to, you know, something like that, you know? Yeah. So it's not, it's not exact size that time, you know, so. Yeah. Good question. Good. And, you know, I, I think what we have seen from this incident especially in Boeing and how it relates back to this digital transformation. Like one of the reasons why, you know, we had these crashes and these, these really tragic situations was actually a software upgrade. Like ultimately the software upgrade was, had good intentions, right? Like prevent, like, you know, make adjustments to the tilt of the plane based off of like sensors. But then you know, we kind of also talked about in this podcast, why it is so, so slow to change? Because I think what yeah. we realize is that even though we can make all of these theoretically great decisions, use technology, digitize the entire process and help humans and us make better decisions. Like we also also realize some of the extremely positive and negative impact that it can make you know obviously in this situation was not a good one yeah we have to be careful especially it's a very challenging i sometimes and with this uh, software guys who go through checking their work so you know it's a challenging job it's not easy you know sometimes a small mistake can cause a problem maybe the other thing that comes to mind ramesh is like this intersection between reliability and quality and i've talked to a few other people on the podcast about this, but I'm just curious your take, like what is, wh- where do you feel like the intersection is between like reliability, quality, and you know, safety is oftentimes a third one. Yeah, well, quality is really, they're looking quality of that product. You know, yeah. is it meeting the specific requirements, specifications or not, you know, that's what quality, that's what they look. Reliability really, gets out of that plant area, gets in the people side when they work using that equipment, that come reliability comes there. So reliability after it has gone out of plan, after it has gone to quality issues, resolve those and reliability is after. So we can see that many places I have seen reliability part of quality or quality part of reliability is vice versa. It's a, but to me, quality is a more a meeting specification or not. Yeah. yeah. It's checking whether that product meets a specification, the requirements or not. That's what it does. It doesn't go the reliability part. Maybe the, the thought process here is that like having a reliable, reliable asset that's running to spec, yes. that's running under reliable, you know, the, the conditions that it was designed to run under that's, that's will create products that will that are you know produced meet. to specification which ultimately leads to a safer work environment versus like operating under you know constant breakdowns machines that are running outside of their designed environments and it has this like trickle down effect. And I think that there's a lot of like people that say, you know, there's a direct correlation, indirect correlation to all three of those or. A couple of weeks ago, I was doing a webinar on relationship between reliability and safety. Yeah. Okay? And there's a definite relationship over the years. What I found again, as we do more planned work, you know, 
as we do more planned work, we become more reliable and safer. Now, there are two things are happening. Doing planned work means we are, we are sending our people with the planned jobs. They're doing it in a, in a job, they have job plan, everything, they have right tools, they know how to do those things. And if they are doing an unplanned job, they, be, they don't know and they're always in a hurry to fixing things, they're bound to do some mistakes. Yeah. They may not have right tools. They may not have right instructions. And once they don't have, they do some mistakes and that cause the problem, safety issues. Yeah. So I think there's a, and I have seen, I have done it. We did it for four, 12 years. We did the watch the data as we started doing more planned work and, and scheduling compliance got much better. Yeah. Our downtime went down after safety incident went downhill too. So, I mean, those things happen. Uh, we have to, and Ron Moore, friend of mine, who is also a reliability guru, and he has done a lot of work in this area. And his correlation is pretty high relationship. And I have watched that too. Yeah. You know, my own experience. Yeah. Yes, reliability, safety go hand in hand. And quality too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Ramesh, we covered a lot. Everything from the digital transformation to some of the you know, more recent topical events um, with Boeing and RCM and you know, reliability within aerospace industry and ultimately this intersection between you know, reliability, um, safety and quality. We've covered a lot today. Um, I wanna ask you, Ramesh, what's, what's, what do you feel like is the biggest takeaway that you hope all of our li listeners are gonna learn from today's discussion? Digital transformation, something we have to think about practical and tangible. And we organizations should do those. Those are important, but we have to do some change management. So people can accept that change easily. We have to find out why they shy away, not going on computer, why they want to print out or what they want, why, what's the reason we have to do that. I think digital transformation is important, and but it's going to, it's like a changing things and it's going is a change it's is a change it's going to take a while it doesn't happen overnight people have to start confidence in that system you know that's what we have to create and it takes time all right all right well Ramesh I really enjoyed today's conversation learned a lot talked about a lot of really interesting topics Ramesh you know as always can you share with all of our listeners the different ways that they can connect with you Hey, they can contact me if they want to, anybody, ramesh.gulati at hotmail.com or ramesh.gulati at reliabilityx.com. You know, so either way, I got an email over there too, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Ramesh absolutely means it. If you want to reach out to him, you know, he's very, very responsive over email and really appreciate all the time and effort that you dedicate towards, you know, helping our industry and talking to people within our industry to help, you know, move us all forward. Thank you so much again, Ramesh. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in today's episode of the Maintenance Mavericks podcast. Again, I'm Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep, and you can also connect with me. I'm very active on LinkedIn or shoot me an email directly at ryan at upkeep.com. I hope everyone enjoyed today's conversation. I really look forward to uh, seeing and connecting with all of you soon. Thanks again, Ramesh. Until next time. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. Bye.